The 20th century is marked by the ever-increasing emancipation of the individual from the social institutions of society. The Cultural Revolution of the 1960s ushered in an age of debauchery and sexual liberation as the contraceptive pill and second wave feminism emphasised the importance of the individual breaking free from the strictures of society, to break free from a life of prudishness and matrimony, and to engage in a life of self-directed pleasure, sex, drugs, rock and roll. The institutions that once restrained the individual's desires crumbled to ash throughout the 20th century. Belief in marriage dwindled after the passage of the Divorce Act in 1969, which enabled couples to more easily leave their marriages through no-fault divorces, and with it, people are now entering marriages and long-term relationships at the lowest recorded levels in the last 100 years. Indeed, as Peter Hitchens remarks, more people were married overall in 1895 than they were in 1995, despite the population being considerably higher in 1995. Today, more people than ever are living self-directed lives, free from the commitments of long-term relationships, marriages, religion or children, and instead are juggling their time between careers and seeking lives of individual pleasure. And as Johan Hariri notes, we are lonelier than we have ever been. Life today is one of growing isolation and individualism. As we flee practices that once forced our attention towards other people, we have become increasingly narcissistic. As the psychologist Gene Twenge notes, we are living in the middle of Generation Me. According to Twenge, in a 2008 study titled Ego Inflation Over Time, she found that from 1982 until 2006, the average score on a narcissistic personality inventory increased 2 points from a score of 15.5 to a score of 17.5 out of 40. Now, this is not to suggest that everyone has become selfish, but rather that we are seeing a growth in individualistic traits such as assertiveness, agency, and extroversion. As 20 notes, in times of abundance, people display more typically individualistic traits as they operate under the assumption that they are less dependent on other people to meet their needs. While conversely, in times of economic instability, people tend to display more collectivistic traits as they recognise that they depend on other people to meet their needs. What this demonstrates is that when individuals believe that they can reach their goals on their own, they tend to undervalue the need for human connection. As the West has amassed more wealth and secured greater living conditions, the fans of individualism have been fanned not only by the winds of economic prosperity, but by the rise of increasingly liberal parenting styles in the 80s and 90s, and with the social media age in the noughties and 2010s. As MacDonald remarks, the rise in narcissistic traits can be partly ascribed to lax and indulgent parenting styles, remarking that, with parents seeing their children as extensions of themselves, they want to be mates, the boundaries aren't set, and children get very confused. You're great, you're terrific, maybe we're not, maybe we need to know that we're just ordinary. Moreover, as Bushman and Brummelman found in a six-month longitudinal study, routinely overpraised children displayed narcissistic traits six months to a year later. What this shows is that cheap and easily given praise can lead to an increasingly inflated and self-centred ego. In a Norwegian study conducted by Andreessen, Pallison and Griffiths on the relationship between social media use, narcissism and self-esteem, they found that addictive social media use reflected a need to feed the ego, leading to an increased sense of grandiosity and a predilection to seek out emotional reassurance. Furthermore, in a 2018 study conducted by the University of Swansea on the relationship between visual social media use and the development of narcissism, whereby researchers tracked 74 participants aged 18 to 34 over four months and used the narcissistic personality inventory to quantify their narcissistic traits. What they found was that participants who posted large quantities of photos and selfies showed a 25% increase in narcissism and that specifically those who used Facebook and other social media platforms that focused on images rather than words became more narcissistic over time. What ties these three causes of increasing narcissism together is the exaggerated sense that we are in some way uniquely special, that we can live a life independent from others, and that fulfillment can be found in proving that we are more popular and more successful than everyone else. However, as Pat McDonald points out, there are five principles for becoming less narcissistic, such as exercising greater gratitude, modesty, 
compassion for self and others, mindfulness, and by engaging with our community. In this regard, to become less narcissistic and more compassionate as a society, we must escape the gravity well of the ego. As the philosopher Iris Murdoch writes in The Sovereignty of the Good, the problem is to accommodate inside moral philosophy and to suggest methods of dealing with the fact that so much of human conduct is moved by mechanical energy of an egocentric kind. In the moral life, the enemy is the fat, relentless ego. Moral philosophy is properly, and in the past has sometimes been, the discussion of this ego and of the techniques for its defeat. In this manner, murder takes inspiration from religion and concocting an antidote to narcissism reflecting on the nature of prayer. As the Danish existentialist Kierkegaard remarked, prayer does not change the nature of God, but of the one who prays. It is in this regard that Murdoch invites us to think about the experience of prayer. As we open up fully to God in the act of prayer and lower our psychological barriers and self-defense mechanisms, the individual becomes more vulnerable and in the process pays loving and just attention to the object of God. It is this state of consciousness that we should hope to replicate in our everyday lives by becoming more open and vulnerable. We come to see the world more clearly and lovingly. Murdoch invites us to think about a mother and her daughter-in-law. At first, the mother thinks that the daughter-in-law is loud and garish, brusque and always tiresomely juvenile. As time passes, the mother, being an intelligent and self-critical individual, capable of paying just and loving attention to someone, has a change of heart and comes to see the daughter as fun and engaging, not vulgar but refreshingly simple and full of youthful energy. By cultivating a capacity to look on the world with loving and just attention, we come to see the world in a way that is not tainted with our own ego. The mother could just have easily thought that the daughter-in-law was not good enough for her son and closed herself off to her, simply seeing her as unworthy. But by stepping outside of her own ego, she is thus able to see more clearly and lovingly. As Murdoch writes, By opening our eyes, we do not necessarily see what confronts us. We are anxiety-ridden animals. Our minds are continually active fabricating an anxious and usually self-preoccupied and often falsifying veil which partially conceals the world. Our states of consciousness differ in quality. Our fantasies and reveries are not trivial and unimportant. They are profoundly connected with our energies and our ability to choose and act. To live more compassionately, we must pierce the veil of the inflated ego by engaging in a range of self-forgetting practices. She writes, I am looking out of my window in an anxious and resentful state of mind, oblivious to my surroundings, perhaps brooding about the damage done to my prestige. Then suddenly, I observe a hovering kestrel. In a moment, everything is altered. The brooding self, with its hurt vanity, has disappeared. There is nothing now but the kestrel. And when I return to thinking of the other matter, it seems less important. Similarly, Murdoch notes that good art also shows us how difficult it is to have an objective view of the world, to appreciate the wonder and the self-contained aimlessness of the world, which we are normally too self-involved to recognise. Moreover, Murdoch also recommends that by engaging in intellectual disciplines, we can also discover the value in our ability to forget ourselves and to be realistic, to be just, and to connect with the world. In this manner, we use our imagination not to escape the world and to slip into the ego, but to join in and immerse ourselves in the world. For Murdoch then, if we wish to overcome our increasingly individualistic and narcissistic tendencies, we must cultivate not only a habit of acting lovingly and justly, but we must, in our conscious attention that we place on the world, also come to see the world in a loving and just manner. And it is only by engaging in a range of practices that we could hope to cultivate such habits and behaviours. And so long as our attention is placed on the self and we focus on the dazzling object of our own being, we may come to see nothing else but ourselves. Perhaps one of the greatest problems facing society and one of the most important lessons we can learn is in the value of escaping our inflated, fat, relentless ego. If you've liked this video and want to see more videos on how philosophy can help us study society, then please share, subscribe and like the video. Thank you.